Okay, so this week we're finally going to do it. I have been planning for probably over a month to try and figure out how do I want to approach teaching you about cage work beatery. It's something that's near to my heart, but I'll be honest with you, I'm still figuring out what I'm doing. So maybe come take the journey with me. I've done it for a long time, but it was something I kind of worked out on my own, and I kind of have my own way of doing it. And it's interesting because when you read in the Haskell book about how that line, which is cage work beatery, is the, the whole focal of that line. It's, you see that, you think Haskell. And that's the kind of t stuff we're going to be doing here. Um, when I read back through all the different generations of Haskell jewelry, they came up with new techniques all the time. And isn't that true when you're at your workbench and you work along and one day, oh, 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 I see how I want to do this differently and you begin to do it differently. And then a, a month or a few weeks later, you see something else. It's just your work starts to evolve. Well, that's kind of how it was with me uh, whenever I caged and kind of how it was with that company and probably continues to be. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite you over here and I'm going to show you some of the basic components of a caged piece, show you a real Haskell piece, a piece that Bisu did that's been working on the last couple of weeks, a couple simple little techniques to get you started, but for the most part it's going to be up to you. You're going to have to work it out for yourself the same way as I did, they did. I know there are classes out there you can take, but to be honest with you, the ones that I've seen, um, I didn't really feel like they quite had the feel of it. It's, it's kind of loose. It's kind of random. That's where reading the book and drinking in those pictures is going to help you the most. So come on over here before we run completely out of time, and I'll show you what I've come up with. Okay, so here we see some basic components that... I would choose to do to work on a cage piece and one of the first things I would want to line up when I was making a design would be I would want to choose my filigree. Now you can find the perforated discs, they're usually like a heart or a circle where they're kind of domed up and they have little holes in them and those are okay and they work and, and there's a little form fitting back that you can just prong in. You know some of the older Haskell pieces were actually made that way but as time went on they weren't so much. I love working with filigree. It's a little easier um, to me more authentic to the look that I love best in Haskell. But for example you see these are two identical filigree. Why would you want to? Well it's because I would work my design on this piece and the highs and the lows and DAP piece is, is good because you have room to bend your wire up underneath. So I like a DAP piece instead of just a perfectly flat piece, although you can deal with a flat piece. But when I would get my design all made, then I would take and I would put this one on the back, you see, and I would cover all my wire, right? And then I would finally take this very, very fine... 28 gauge wire and wire along the edges as invisibly as I could. It's really like embroidery. Think of it as a type of embroidery and um, it might come kind of full circle for you that way. But that's what you need to start. You need two filigrees, one or something to cover the back of your work because otherwise you're going to have this piece with all this wire hanging out. No good. That's not a finished piece. Okay. Uh, to show you, for example, this is a real Haskell piece. This is one of my little treasures. You can see how that they've wired on the square cut seed beads here. Little kind of seed pearlies, check. And they've wired the little flowers delicately. They would have done this all separately and then applied them to the piece. They wouldn't have put that on there first and tried to wire it. It would have been impossible. Um, this is a, your, your Nikki type pearl that came from Japan that Haskell alone had. You're not going to find them on the secondary market. If you do, somehow they leaked out of the Haskell warehouse and weren't supposed to because they don't sell them. At least they didn't up to a few years ago. You couldn't even get a few for a few repairs. Um, as you can see, here's how it's made on the back. And there are actually two of these filigree here one covering and then another one that's dapped out over it and here you go with their nameplate soldered on and you can tell 
uh, their old Russian gold plate because it has a slight mustardy green type antique to it. It's it's very pale, not like real green, but it's just I don't know. It's kind of a mustardy look to it, and that's how you can tell it's the real old Haskell filigree. There's still some out there in the market. Sometimes eBayers have it, but um, you got to watch. You better know your seller because they might be telling you it is and it isn't. Maybe they got some of our Russian gold plate trying to pass it off, which I'd hate to see that happen. That's not why I had this made. This is our Russian gold plate, and as you can see, it's very close in appearance to theirs, but it doesn't have that mustardy color. Ours has a honey antique, and you can tell the difference. But anyway, this is a piece that I started, and I wired these little pieces on, these little flowers. I used 28 gauge wire, gold plated wire. You want plated wire. Do not use brass unplated wire. Okay, and I have my opposing piece, so when I'm done, I would just go over that. And I like these pieces because they're kind of like a grid and you've got your holes. So maybe we'll do a little bit together and I'll show you how to put a piece on. Okay, don't pull out too big of a piece of wire at first to work with because you'll be poking yourself with it and you're just not going to have a fun time. I'm kind of eyeballing this. How far along do I want? I think right about here. So I'm going to stick this through here. Okay, and of course on camera I'm going to probably be poopy at this, but... You'll get the point, and that's the main thing, because you're going to have to work this out for yourself anyway. But you see how I'm coming around and around and around on this? And I've got a tail out the back, and I'll show you why in just a bit. Okay, so that's on there pretty good and tight, but I think I'm going to come up in here. See what I'm saying about embroidery? Doesn't it remind you of embroidery, really? I'm going to come up in here tight. Okay, now I've got my tail. Pull my tail out of the way. And now I'm going to come over with another piece. And that's not on as tight as I'd like, so maybe I will come up onto that one more time. you got to watch. Sometimes this wire will want to kink on you a little bit. Like I say, it's your technique. You work it out. I just kind of do this stuff. And, you know, once I get in my zone with it, I find it to be very, very relaxing. Okay, so now I'm going to put another piece on. Don't worry if it's a little bit loosey-goosey. You can always deal with that later. It's not going to be super tight. So now I want to put another piece, I think, like right here. Maybe. Because where am I going to end up? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so then I'm going to come through there again with my tail. I have enough for another piece. Here's my tail. Okay. So now I'm going to come up on that again, and again. Now I'm really going to need more wire there, but I have this piece over here. What I'm going to do right now is this is the twist off. And you guys may know this from other beading that you do, but around those pliers is best. Crisscross this, because I'm going to run out of um, wire, and I, this twist off is really important for strength. I'm going to get this, and I'm just going to twist, 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 twist. Now, you got to be careful you don't twist it too tight or too close because it'll snap and break at probably the most inopportune moment that you don't want it to. Now, I'm going to clip this off with my dull little nippers. I don't know where my other ones are. I have to find them. Probably over there in the rack. These are just about worthless, wouldn't you say? But I've used them a lot. Oh, made in Taiwan. Good tools. Yeah, that's what you want. <laughs> Not. Okay, so see how I twisted that? Now I'm going to twist it in. I'm going to coil it in. Okay, so that you almost don't see it. I have another piece over here that I twisted earlier. Again, coil that in. Turn that in. Get that underneath as tight as you can because you're going to have to go over that with your facing piece. So as little wire as possible. And here I'm going to kink this a little bit because that will make it tighter kink it a little bit and make it tighter, you see? But what I would do, for lack of time, I'm not going to be able to go the whole way around, but see, I would put this one on here next, and I would have a circle it, right? And then, you know, I might go into that with, say, now I want, um, I wouldn't use this piece, but just for sake of time, I'm going to show you. Okay, I've got these three layers here. This is wrong for that, but I'm just going to show you. I've got this painted go-go thing here, and then I've got a piece of copper rocks. Okay, 
This is why rhinestone head pins are the bomb when you're caging. Okay? This goes in here. This goes in here and here and here. How pretty is that? Okay, now, if I wanted to stick that into this design, like as a focal, like an asymmetrical focal or something. Okay, so I will come in this way and look at that. Bring that up and under. And then I just fuss with it and loop it till I got it tight. Okay. So you could see where I'm going with it. We've done stuff like this before, so there's no need to waste time with it. But do you see how this is going to end up looking? So I stick that up under there like that. And then I could just set this all with little pearlies and stones, and I could go in and, you know, take it from there, guys. But basically that's it. And then when you get to the back, this goes on the back, you know, over the wire, and then you then you could uh, cage that in. Now you might say, well, where's my pin back going to go? Well, if you don't have, if it's going to be a necklace centerpiece, don't need that. But a pin back can actually be wired in right across there too. You need a small one, or glued. It's up to you. Uh, case in point, here's one I made the other day. I took a heart that I had and I drilled it three times, stuck these in there with wire, and put them onto a filigree. I think it was like a grandma's garden filigree that was stacked up. Uh, and put that in there and started just fooling with it. Got it on there, wired in, and then I put a, one of these under that so that I could go out and I just went, you can see how I tend to go kind of this way, random, then this way, random. That's kind of my style. And I didn't plan this a whole lot, it just kind of went there and it kind of think it came out really good, but I haven't put a pin back because I think it might be a necklace till I'm done. But here's another piece that I've loved using a lot because of these perforations here. You can bead out with seed beads through here and then attach a hand. If you go in one of my galleries, you'll see this piece used with the hand wired on. And then I've gone around the wrist of the hand with pearls like it's a bracelet. And it's really cool that way. Um, here's a rose montique. I don't know, Robbie, can you get in here tight enough without blurring it? Rosemont tees are integral in doing this kind of work. They need to be wired in. There's none in this piece actually, but um, most Haskell pieces have them. See the little X on the back? That's actually a little channel that you can wire through, okay? Um, here's one that I can show you. I've wired onto this piece. It flipped, of course, because I don't have it all the way down. But it's wired and see, so you could just go all the way around there or in with your wire. This is a good piece, too, because it's real easy to see where you're going. We sell this piece. Another piece that's good to use, if you want to go with a brass ox look, this, this piece is really good. We have it in our filigree section. You would bead onto this, and then when you're done, this goes on the back, bead over, and then you would wire over it to make, you know, cover your covering. And then maybe you might even want to put another piece over top of it just the same way as Haskell did. They double layered it because you might still be seeing some wire through that. So you might want to do that. And then it would make you a nice centerpiece. But that's basically it. You want seed beads, which I don't have right here, but everybody gets seed beads. And another thing that's a good element is a bead cap inverted. And then you'll put a bead into that. And you can make a cluster of these. What if you did like a cluster of these that had pretty beads in them? Then you did some leaves out from that and some seed beading. So you'd have a caged piece that would be in the vintage style. So seed beads are very, very important. You invert them and use them for a type of a bead cap. So anyway, I wanted to show you really quick because we're about out of time. This is the book you want to get. You can go to Amazon Books, Barnes & Noble, whatever. You want to get this book. This is your textbook. You get this. You get old pieces and you look at them and you just work it. And we'll have some more. We'll, we'll talk about this some more as it goes along and we'll get our technique down. But I hope this gets you started on a new journey because it's a wonderful one.